by the parties decided to backslide and leave the ministry. So I know. <laughs> He's the hallway. That, there are many ways to backslide, my friend. Just kidding. All right, how's we doing today? Just kidding about the backsliding. Uh, can you hear me now? Very, very good. All right, uh, I, I heard a really great statement on uh, revival. It's from uh, Dr. Rick Flanders. And he said that, he said, you have to be revived before you're revived. I thought that was really cool. What he means is, you got to be saved before you're revived. And uh, a lot of uh, what he said um, is my message. No, I'm just kidding. But it was, um, you know, there's some truth to that. Uh, and a great truth is the fact that nobody's going to be revived if they're not saved. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, if you're not born again, then you're still separated from the Lord. And so that's what he means by saying, you got to be revived before you're revived. You know what I'm talking about? So I think that's a pretty uh, interesting statement. I want you to turn your Bibles to Proverbs 23. And again, we, can, we really encourage you to come to the revival. Uh, I guess it's going to be this week, uh, I believe. Uh, everything's a little bit askew. And uh, hey, you can't stop the Lord from moving. Amen. Uh, I'm going to move this mic. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Uh, and if you are groaning, the, you'll, you'll be sitting soon again. So when somebody asks you to stand, that usually means stand up. Unless it's opposite day, which we all know. The day is not opposite day. Okay, so Proverbs 23. I had another message planned out. It was, <laughs> it was out of Proverbs 3, and it was called this. I was pretty excited to preach it. And I, I redid everything last night. It was called How to Take a Really Good Nap. And uh, I was pretty excited to preach it. I thought it was really funny. Um, in Proverbs 3, it talks about how you can have sweet sleep. And I just thought, man, that, that is an awesome message. Because who likes napping here? You might be napping here in about a second. You're here to hear me preach. But uh, the Lord impressed in my heart is in reverse. Um, I went to a conference over the weekend. And this wasn't this guy's passage. Uh, but he referenced this verse. And uh, I don't know. The Lord really spoke to me through this verse. And I hope he speaks to you, as I'm sure he would if you allow him to. So, um, I'm going to ask you to, on purpose, open your eyes, open your ears, and open your hearts. And I want you to really consider what God has to say today. All right? So, if you turn to Proverbs 23, and uh, one verse, we'll kind of uh, jump around this chapter a little bit. Verse 26. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Let's read that again. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Let's pray. Father, I would just ask Lord, that you would help us today, Lord. I'm, I'm tired today. I'm uh, feeling a little weak. And I have a lot of things going through my mind. And uh, I just ask that what's done today will please me. Lord, that somebody would come away from this thing today and be changed for your sake. If there is an unsaved person here, Lord, that they would get saved today. Lord, and if there is a dormant Christian, I'm going to call them a dormant Christian. Uh, somebody who is saved, but living carnally, and is happy not to go to hell, but desires that you would not change their life. Uh, somebody that is thrilled that they'll go to heaven someday, but they don't have any desire that you would change anything about them now. So God, I, I just ask that you would be with those people Lord, today, and that, uh, Lord, that I would preach today with a sound mind with love, with cords of love, Lord. And God, Lord, that your Holy Ghost would go forth, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. God, I just ask that you would be with us today, Lord, and I would be clear and not unclear. And Lord, that we would open our hearts, open our eyes and our ears, and listen on purpose. Thank you for all that you do and all that you will do. Yeah. Maybe see it. Are you ever 
startled when somebody asks you to give them something? Are you ever startled when you own something and somebody asks for it? And somebody says, I want you to, to get me this belonging of yours. Is that a little startling? We're not here to make fun of the homeless. I believe scripture uh, specifically preaches against that. But is it a little startling when you're walking downtown and you encounter a homeless person and they ask you for maybe even food or money? Are you a little startled by it, the fact that somebody would ask something of you? That they would ask you to give them something? The title of this message is, Be Careful Who's Asking for Your Heart. Or as a subtitle, Give Me. I do think it's a little startling when somebody asks me for something. When somebody asks me to give them something that belongs to me. I, I think there's something interesting about that. Um, with me, on the buses and in Sunday school, I'm more likely to give away candy to somebody, to somebody that doesn't ask for it. I'm more likely to do that. When somebody asks me for candy, uh, part of me thinks like, oh, they're not trying to earn it. You know, maybe that's I'm untrue on my part. You know, you may very well have good intentions. I don't know. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, I try my best to give it to the person who's earning it. And not that homeless people don't deserve money. That's not my, what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to show you is that when somebody asks you for something, I think it's a little sorry. I, I think it's interesting. The fact that somebody would ask anything of me, I find very compelling. When I was in eighth grade, I, uh, we never really had a ton of money, um, but uh, I went up the street and I needed new shoes. I used to wear my, who wears their shoes until their toes hit the ground? You know, I used to do that all the time. And uh, I, mean, I was growing really fast, and so a lot of times like, my shoes, my toes would be literally hitting the ground. Uh, and I have a very busy street that I live on. It's basically a highway. And so it would be very troubling for me not to have actual footwear. All right? So anyway, um, we didn't have a ton of money. But one day I encountered, I think, about 25 bucks or something like that. And my mom, I think my mom actually gave me the $25 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. I'm probably giving myself too much credit. But I had this money. And my mom said, why don't you go up the street to the shoe store and get yourself a pair of shoes? I said, okay. So at that time... Uh, skateboarding was very popular. I've never been a skateboarder, but I won't lie to you, I thought the gear was very cool at the time. I thought airwalks were cool, I thought vans were kind of mean looking, they looked very comfortable to me, and I just thought that would be very interesting to have a pair of shoes like that. Uh, certainly, I'm probably not going to invest in a skateboard. I can't even imagine skateboarding down the street. The thought of it frightens me. I tried skiing one time, and it was, <laughs> let me just tell you, it was a horrible experience. Uh, but it was, you know, I don't imagine that's going to happen. Anyway, I thought the gear was cool. I actually think uh, sports gear is very neat. I always tell people I could blow my whole check that I get from my job at big sporting goods just because I like gear so much on the inside. I think hockey gear looks cool. Um, whenever I see a, a hockey player, I like their jerseys. I, I, I like gloves. I, I don't know. There's something interesting about that. Movie. But anyway, at this point, skateboarding was the new in thing at our school. The skateboarding is so popular now, I don't really imagine it's all that popular. It's maybe some. Well, I wanted a pair of airwalks, but they were pretty expensive. And I wanted a pair of vans, but they were pretty expensive too. But there was another brand of skateboarding shoes, and here's what they were called. They were called 26 Reds. You ever hear those shoes? 26 Reds? Yeah? Maybe one person. You know about 26 Reds? Amazing. This is amazing. I didn't know these until later. Anyway, there were these really cool shoes. And they had a 26 on the back. And I remember looking at the pair of shoes, and they were black, and they had this red stripe going on the side, and this kind of uh, fluorescent white stripe that, that uh, encroached on the red stripe. So they were like these very edgy looking shoes. And I remember putting them on, and they were so comfortable. I remember thinking, these are awesome shoes. And guess what? They were in my price range. So I remember thinking, these are some pretty great shoes. And I, I bought them, and I showed my mom, those are pretty handsome. My mom was like, that's pretty cool. I was thinking to myself, it's going to be a good day tomorrow. Well, it was. You know, I got, I think, the most compliments on a, on a pair of shoes that I've ever gotten in my life. Um, I remember specifically Emily Harrison uh, looked at my shoes and she said, Wes has got new shoes. And she looked down at my shoes and I, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I know we can. And, you know, she was, uh, you know, let's say, a cute girl. Uh, and uh, I took that as a, as a win that day. That was pretty awesome. So, other people began to notice my shoes, and they would look at them, and they would think to themselves, these are awesome. 
these are really great. And I gotta tell you, I was on top of the world. I remember just thinking, like, who's gonna stop me? I mean, I was just going everywhere, and I was like very conscious of how my shoes look. It wasn't that crazy, but that's how I felt. Well, there was another person that noticed my shoes, and his name was Ken Abbott. Now, Ken Abbott was a year older than me and was a grade younger than I was. Not to sound mean, not to sound cruel, but a year older than me and a grade under me. Really? Keep our comments to ourselves. Ken Abbott outweighed me by maybe 100 pounds. He was big, he was huge. He was actually a little wider than he was tall. And we're just thinking, this guy's a big kid. Well, I got wind of him. And a lot of people came up to me and said, you know, Ken knows your shoes. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, he wants them. Like, he wants my shoes. He's like, yeah, he says he's going to pay them. I'm like, what? He wants my shoes? What on earth? He wants to take them from me? And I was like, this, this is unbelievable. I just remember laughing it off. It just seemed incredible to me that somebody would try to take my shoes. Well, anyway, uh, some of my friends that I was kind of becoming friends with were over here. And, and I remember coming out of the side doors of the school, and, and Ken Abbott was right there. And, and he approached me, I think, later that day, and he came up to me and he said, I want those shoes. And I said, you're not going to get my shoes. I mean, just like, even though he was bigger than me, uh, I mean, I was taller. I was in the, the Abe Lincoln reach, you know what I'm saying? Um, but uh, even though he's better, I was going to give up my shoes. Uh, I have my father in me, and my father has a temper that's about this short. And so, like, that can flip on in just a second. And I really try to turn it down as much as possible. And so um, he goes, if you don't give those shoes, I'm going to take them to walk, is what he said. Ken Evans said that. And I looked at him straight in the face, and I was like, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> And I thought, oh my soul, did I just pick a fight? <laughs> I'm about to get in a fight tomorrow. And so like, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to fight Ken Abbott for my shoes. <laughs> so I was like, I don't like fighting. I don't, I don't know what he's going to fight. He's going to push the wrestle. And, you know, there's one thing to be like, that would be on the outside. And, you know, jump on your buddy. It's like, you know, you're just scrapping and doing all the good fun. But it's another thing to fight for the author of your kicks. You know what I'm talking about? And it's the other thing to actually agree to a fight. I remember calling my cousin, uh, his name is Fadi, and uh, he's always been one of the great worldly influences of my life. And uh, I remember him like, hey man, I, I think I'm going to get in a fight tomorrow. What do I do? And he's like, oh, really? Oh, okay, okay. So my cousin is giving me advice on how to fight. You know, I'm like, thinking like I'm, I'm eighth grade, I'm defending the honor of my 26 reds, I'm calling my cousin on, on, on different types of moves. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Man, I'm ready for this thing. I didn't tell my mom, and she's finding out like now after a couple of years. And so I remember thinking to myself, this is crazy. I'm about to fight this guy. But I never had it. I never encountered him uh, that following day. I, just, I was like, well, I'm ready to throw down. And I, I'm not encouraging you to fight. So if this ever happens to you, then you go to a teacher, you go to a worker, you go to your dad and mom. That's how you get here. So this is how idiotic I was in my age. Well, anyway, the next morning I saw him. And he said, <coughs> sorry, man. He said, Wesley, I want those shoes. But his tone changed a little bit this time. I, I don't know if a lot of people have stood up to him in the past or something. And I was like, Ken, I, I can't give you my shoes. I, I can't. He goes, listen, listen, I got some Jordans, man. I'll give you my Jordans. Like, he wore these shoes, and he was going to give them his worn shoes. But he's like, I want you to give me those shoes. And it just came to the point where we just agreed it's not going to happen. You know, he wanted to take something from me. He said, give me your shoes. And we ended up not becoming that bad of friends. I mean, it was kind of weird. I usually get along with most people. But I was always was struck by this thing that somebody would want to physically take something from me. Isn't that interesting? That somebody would say, give me something? I think that's very interesting. You know, it's not always godly to ask for something. That's like that. What about the prodigal son? Do you remember how he left his dad? He said, give me the portion of thy goods. That was uh, Luke 15. What about Judas? Do you know when he went behind Jesus' back, behind the Pharisees himself? He said this to them in Matthew 26, 15. He said, what will he give me? This is what Judas said. 
Isn't that interesting? The fact that he was willing to sell out the Savior, and he said, I'll do it if you give me something. What about Goliath? Goliath was sitting there in front of Israel, and he said, why don't you give me a man that we may fight together? Give me. Why don't you give me somebody like that? That's out there in 1 Samuel 17. What about Esau? Esau coming in after the hunt, and he would have sold anything. In fact, he did. He sold his birthright, and he said, feed me. Feed me. I'm at the point of death. I'll take whatever you got. I'll give you whatever you want. Give me. So we know when somebody asks for something to be given to them, we know that quite frankly it can be quite ungodly, can't it? Is it possible, however, to ask for something in a godly way? I think so. Is it possible to ask for something godly and for it to be right and true and holy? Well, Jacob requested a blessing from the Lord, didn't he? And he said, I won't leave until you bless me. He said that to, to God himself, Jesus Christ, he said that to Caleb was promised his inheritance. And there was a day in the Bible where he almost didn't get it. And he said, I want that mountain, is what he said out there, out there in Joshua 14. And there are moments in life where you can ungodly ask for something that is unholy, or if something is promised to you by God, you can take it in a holy way. You, would you agree with me? That sometimes to say, give me something, is sometimes ungodly. But if you ask in the right spirit, in accordance with God's will, it can be something very true and very holy. Then it can either be good or bad when you ask somebody to give you something. And there's an interesting man in this passage we just read. And he said this, my son, give me thy heart, and let thy eyes observe my ways. There are many groups, things, persons, and your own father that is asking you for your heart. That doesn't sound like my God, man. It sounds very God, if you ask me. It sounds very holy that a father would ask for his son's heart, that he would ask for it to be given to him. That, to me, sounds very godly, and I, I came to this conclusion. All believers and non-believers alike will give their heart to something. But the thrust of this chapter is this. Give your heart to your father. Give your heart to your father. Give it to him. Give him the inner person, the inner man, your soul. Give it to your father. Give it to your father. But who are these people competing for your heart? Well, look to me at verse 20 and 21 in the same chapter. Be not among wine bearers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rent. You know who's, who wants your heart? Wine bibbers want your heart. You know what a wine bibber sounds like in a funny word? Alcoholics want your heart. Other people that go partying and drinking, you know they want your heart? And the, the interesting thing about this passage, you can find other passages in the Bible where drinking is explicitly preached against, but in this passage, it's saying don't even be among them. In other words, don't go to a drinking party. In other words, don't go to a party where there's alcohol at. You know what I'm talking about? Don't go and be the guy that just doesn't drink. You know, like, I, I'm, I'm just hanging out with my friends. I'm not going to drink myself, but I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just hanging out with my friends. Because Solomon is telling Rehoboam his son, don't be among the wine drinkers. He didn't even outright say in this passage, don't drink. Obviously, I think it's implied. He said, don't party with those people. Don't party with those people. You know, when I was in high school, my friends began to... Uh, discover drink. And I never drank. It was never a temptation for me. I mean, it was eventually, I'm sure it could have become one. I never drank in my life. Um, but my friends began to drink. And I remember, I came to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to hang out with my friends and just be the sober guy. I'm just going to be the guy that doesn't drink. And I'm not with them. You know, honestly, I felt so weird. I felt so weird that people were swaying and they were cracking up. And I didn't really know. And I was trying to force myself to laugh along with them. To, to, to try to, to meet them where they are. And I just thought, well, you know, like, I'm not drinking. I'm not directly sinning. But, you know, if I would have known about this passage, so when Solomon told his son, don't even be among the wine members, then I would have thought to myself, it's against God for me to go there. It, it's against God for me to go to an underage drinking party where there's pot and where there's probably other types of drugs and there's probably great amounts of alcohol. And all those types of things. And I remember just thinking to myself, I can't believe I even went. And, and honestly, I would, I did it through college where I would hang out with my drinking friends. And I wouldn't drink. And I would just, I, I would, I'm just here just to hang out with my friends. You know, my friends would basically ignore me while they were drinking. 
Yeah, you know, they wouldn't even really talk to me that much. They would, they would look to me as, as like, you know, here's the sober guy, here's the boring guy. He's not even drinking along with us. And there was a point, I remember very specifically, where there was a, a friend of mine who said, why don't you just smoke the cigar? Or they tried to even pass a, a, a quote blunt to me one time. I remember just thinking to myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Why am I among the wine bearers? I'm not influencing them. There isn't strength behind my convictions. I'm just pacifying what they're doing. And Solomon's saying, I don't want you to hang out with me. It's worth feeling left out of If you feel left out because your friends are drinking, good. Then you have the strength to stand alone, the courage to be somebody different. That's called being an individual for Jesus Christ. That's called being a soul priest, one who has the strength of his conviction that would stand up and say, I'm not going to go to the stupid drinking party. I'm not going to go. And Solomon is telling his son, why don't you not go? At the same time, he talks about riotous eaters. Now, I'm not condemning you if you like to eat out a lot at Thanksgiving, and those kinds of things. But you know, it's, I think it's more than that. It's the people that feed their flesh. And all they want to do is have fun. And all they want to do is just go out and, and just, you know, like, how does my flesh feel? How does this make me feel? And it's, it's more about just drinking and smoking. It's about training their flesh so that it's appeased, so that there's a, a level of satisfaction. And it's, and it's get this, it's get this. Fuh. It's fun. Well, we didn't have no fun. I just remember thinking to myself, that's not fun. These riotous eaters the Bible's talking about. And they waste their money. You know, like sometimes I think I probably eat out too much. I just think, I could have just saved it, went home, made a bowl of cereal, just like the rest of my life. How many bucks to the boats, baby? It's worth it to stay away from folks like that. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm not talking about not being a giving person and not spending time with somebody because I think it's worth going out to eat with friends to establish friendship and a love between you two. I think it's worth it for those things. But Solomon's saying, why don't you steer clear about that? What about this, verse 27 and 28? Same chapter. What else wants my heart? People that want to take me to their drinking parties. People that want to live in their flesh. But what about this? Wicked women, do you know that wicked women also want my heart? They, they want that. And it's not even that they're maybe in person. What about this? Listen to this, verse 27. For, I'm not trying to sound ugly, this is what the Bible says. For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth wait for a prey and increaseth the transgression among men. What did I say, kids? Men specifically. You know, you know like how pathetic it is when a guy just begins to just fall all over a girl. I mean, like, and she can say whatever she wants, but she's got him around his pinky. And she can begin, maybe she like kind of touches his bicep, and oh man, are you working out? Man, you're so funny. It's so incredible that you would do that. And, and the woman can just make him do whatever she wants, and deep down, she is a deep ditch, the Bible's talking about. And she's a strange woman, and she will make you sin. And the Bible talks about how it's a sin against your own soul. And do you know that a wicked woman is like that? Do you know that they dwell oftentimes in high school and they try to get young men to do things that are awful? I'm not talking about the women that are here. We have some very godly women that are here. But there are women out there that would try to make a man sin because they want something from him. Because they want to seize his soul. And the man is just defenseless. He is hard and it's like he's looking at me. He's like a little deer in the headlights. And this woman is just destroying his soul. You know, but also, it's not just high school, it's not just college. You know that she's on TV, or on a billboard, or in a magazine, or on the internet, and she talks, it's like she's talking to you through that TV screen, and she's flirting with you, and she's making you feel like you're something, and somebody, and she's something that said, oh man, you are so funny, or you are so strong, or oh my, you, you know what, you are really athletic, do you work out all the time? And, and you're just seized by this wicked woman on the team. Do you know that women out there are trying to destroy men? You ever wonder why there, there are men uh, that are just runaways and they're deadbeats and they don't even try to do anything with their life? You wonder why? Because there was a point in their life where they were destroyed by a woman. Right. Destroyed by a woman. And the Bible talks about how their lips are sweeter than honey. But they are a deep you know what a deep ditch is? You know you have to build a deep ditch to bury somebody's body six feet under? And the Bible says, son, there's a woman like that out there. And 
she wants your soul. She'll take you to hell. She'll take you to the grave. She'll put you six feet under. I know some people think it's funny that somebody would even say something like that. You know, in this world today, you know, like the women and men, they're, they're, I mean, like, we're, we're forward thinking. This is not the era for this. No, no. Now more than ever, it's time for young men to act like young men of God. To stand up and to not go to these stupid drinking parties, not to waste all their substance, not live their life just for fun or chicks or, or flirty girls. It's, it's now the time that a young man would stand up because the father is begging for your heart. They say, all these other people really want your heart. They want to take it from you. You know, these wicked girls, they're in TV programs and in movies and in bedroom scenes that we're getting numb to, aren't we? That we, we see and we're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Ah, yeah, it was tough. It was just one scene. You know, like sometimes when you hear people at church talk about movies that they saw, and they're and I was thinking to myself, isn't there like a really wicked scene in that movie? And they're just kind of talking about it like it's nothing. But you know what happened? They went to a woman that's a deep ditch. And she got it. She got it. And she stole part of his soul. It's really wicked. Father wants your heart. He really wants your heart. You know, men can be like that too. Men can be deep dishes. Men can be awful wicked. There are very few godly men these days. But the Father wants your heart. So these groups are crying out for your heart. And whoever holds your heart, you know that they successfully push God out of the way. And they take him away. Oh, God, we took care of God. And yet, the Father, I mean, with passion, and, and with a heart of conviction, saying, Give me your heart. Would you just give me your heart? Look what happens in verse 22. This is what the Father wants. Hearken unto the Father that be happy, and despise not thy mother when she is old. They want you to listen to them. They want, what about verse 23? Buy the truth and sell it not. All wisdom and instruction and understanding. You know, it sounds kind of strange to buy wisdom. But you know what I'm saying? Invest your time in acquiring wisdom and understanding. Invest your time and buy it. And don't sell it out in the marketplace. Don't sell out what the Bible says. Because somebody else is holding your pulse and is beating your heart like this. And they have you because their passions are so deeply controlled by them. I'm talking about the Father wants your heart. He wants to beat it for you. He wants to be the reason that you get up in the day, that you get up in the morning, that you serve him, and you get out there, and you're not afraid to live a godly life. You're not afraid to say, I'm not going to go to that party. And you're not afraid to say to the wrong guy or the wrong girl, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work out. You're not according to biblical standards. You're not like that. Verse 24 says, they want to rejoice because they beget you. Because they came from you. You came from them. And your father wants your heart. You say, my natural father? I don't even have a father. I know that there are probably people here that might not even have a dad that they know. I'm sorry. I hate that that's like that. I hate that it's like that. But it is like that. But you have a natural father. And if you have him available, give him your heart. But that's not all. How about your fathers in this ministry? You know, the Apostle Paul talks about his son, Timothy, or other people that he's one of the Lord, that he actually, he converted them, he helped show them in the Bible how to be saved. You know that probably most of you here got saved in this ministry? You know that you have a spiritual father here, or a spiritual mother that's here? You know that people had begat you in your, in your bonds, that they actually went and they showed you because they love you, they care for you? Do you know that you have spiritual fathers in this ministry right now? And spiritual mothers. Do you know that I, I could start naming names of people? I, I know how invested they are in this ministry. That they act like spiritual, I'm talking about spiritual fathers to the people here that might not even have it. Or the people here that don't even have a mommy. And they want your heart. And they're saying, give me your heart. Give it to me, please. Give me your heart. And your heavenly father wants your heart. You know, if you give, if you're saved, 
And you willingly submit to the authority that's here. In other words, you listen in Sunday school, you listen to the preaching, you're encouraged by it, and you let your heart open up. Do you know that it's like you are giving your heart to Jesus himself? And God is saying from heaven, give me your heart. Please give it to me. But who is my father? In this passage, well, why should anyone listen to anyone? You know, Solomon is talking to Rehoboam. Rehoboam really messed up a lot of things. And Solomon messed up some things too. But Solomon was inspired by the Holy Ghost. And he wrote these words. And, it, you know, it's like, I don't know exactly when in Solomon's life that he technically wrote these words. But I know that Solomon was beginning to invest himself in sins and things like that. But he also knew who God was. He also was a believer. And he was talking to his son. It's like he's saying, please, give me your heart. Give it to me. I, I want to beat it for you. I want to be the one that, I want to be the reason why there's vitality in you. Give me your heart. Submit to these words. Be submissive. And Solomon is begging him. Please give it to me. Our Heavenly Father is asking us to give us his, our hearts. And you know, like, when all those other things are, you know, those exteriors are in the way, it's like we can look at God straight in the face and say, but something else has been. This party has my heart. These friends have my heart. This boyfriend has my heart. This woman has my heart. This television show has my heart. And all the while, there are things that are lifting up your soul that are not Jesus Christ. That's so wicked. That's so ugly. That's so bad. And right now, you are living on God's law and suffering. You have to understand, you'll meet Jesus someday. And he'll actually go through these things with you. You know, somebody here might say, I don't even know my actual dad. Why should I? You know, Jesus, when he was born, he submitted to a stepdad. Didn't he? Somebody that wasn't technically his father. You know, Jesus came to earth in all his glory and splendor, and he took on human flesh, and he came to a stepdad. And he submitted to him. And he, he, guess what else he did? He took up the family business. He became a carpenter like his dad. He became that for his father. Jesus did that. Not only that, you know, David, you know, David submitted to Saul. Saul, who was trying to kill David, you know, he did those types of things. Even though Saul was trying to kill him, David was very submissive to him. What about Esther? Esther submitted to Mordecai, her uncle. And she was willingly submissive. And she thought to herself, I'm just going to give you my heart. You can go ahead and I will do whatever you say. I will live in authority. You know, these days, it's so cool to say, man, I don't do what anyone says. Man, I just do what I want to do. Or I'm not here to make friends. I'm just going to do what it is that I want to do. You know how godly it is when somebody is willing to submissive? That when somebody says, give me your heart, and they say, okay. You know how godly that is? That's so very godly. Now, a couple years ago, I was, uh, I, I, I took an internship where I was going to be on the road for about three months. And at the time, I was like, man, I just got to leave me. Um, I took a financial hit by doing it. Um, I, 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 I took a, a lot of things, but I just knew that's what God wanted me to do. And it was not easy. It was not easy at all. In fact, it was, uh, a lot of ways, it was just totally out of my comfort zone. And, you know, my decisions uh, oftentimes affect my family and those types of things like that. And so it, it was a great stress in many levels. When I met this particular person, he told me this to me. He said, well, Sam... If you're willing to let me be the authority in your life, if you're willing to do that, I think I can help. I think I can help. And I stood there, and I forget which state I was in, uh, actual state, not mental state. I <laughs> know mental state. You know, like, I remember just thinking, okay, you can be the authority in my life on earth. And you know, it's, it's very godly to be submissive to your Sunday school. To go up to your Sunday school teacher and say, can I do something for you? That's very godly. Or what would you like to see? What, what, where am I at right now? And you know it's very godly for you to go to your bus captain and say, it's been a great day. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Is there anything in my life that I, you, you think I should do? That's so godly. It's not about living for yourself and living by your heart and living by your obstinate spirit. It's about giving your heart to the Father. That's what it's about. It's about getting out there and saying, 
Father, just take it. Take it, Jesus. Take my heart and let it just beat in accordance with what you do. It's so holy and godly. You know, you'll be much better for it. I want to end at verse 15 and 19. I think it's just such a beautiful closing. My son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Let not thy heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. For surely there is an end, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thy heart in the way. Who has your heart? Who, who's taking it? Is, it? is it just some guy? Is it just some guy that's not even in church? That's not even saved? Is it some, is it some girl on TV that, that says the Lord's name in vain all the time? Is it, is it a party? Is it St. Patrick's Day is coming up? Is it some wicked event like that now? Is it, is it anything? Is it just living for fun? Does that have your heart? Is that is, is fun standing there in like this black cloak and just going, hey, buddy, let me just beat your heart. And then you think to yourself, man, that was a lot of fun. I think I'll just skip my Bible. Reading. I think I'll just skip prayer. I think I'll just sleep in. It's just one thing. I just, I think I'll just do that. Or, are you sitting there right now thinking, I'm going to give Jesus Christ my heart. And I'm going to give the people that are in charge of me my heart as well. And, and it's like they're begging me. Give me your heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. I just ask that something got through.